Thank you all for coming, and I believe that uh, we'll have a very interesting uh, presentation uh, from uh, our uh, speakers, whom uh, I could uh, well describe as uh, masters of uh, globalization. And I hope that they will uh, share some uh, secrets of their success uh, with uh, all of us. Uh, as you know, uh, mistakes uh, are the ones from, from which we learn. Uh, but it's always better when somebody else uh, is paying for them. So I hope that they will also uh, tell us not only about uh, their uh, great successes, but also about the challenges and uh, probably mistakes that they have done and uh, uh, others could avoid. So uh, we're starting uh, today uh, with uh, Marcus, uh, who, would, uh, who is uh, the uh, managing director of F&F. Uh, &F. Uh, which is uh, Tesco's uh, uh, fashion, uh, fashion uh, brand. Uh, they are at the moment in uh, 12 countries and uh, they have a plan uh, to expand into 45 uh, countries. And uh, Marcus will, uh, will tell us uh, about their plans and how they are going to do that. So please. Uh, good afternoon, and th thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about F&F, &F, which is um, essentially Tesco's clothing brand. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to the, to the brand and also an indication of what our aspirations are, and also how important, clearly, partners and the places that we go to are, which will link back to the sand and snow theme of today. So we have one clothing brand that we own, and that is F&F. &F. It's in about more, just more than 2,000 locations in Tesco stores, um, and it takes just over 2, million, 2 billion sorry, euros a year. So it's a reasonably sized clothing brand in its own right, but that's just been within the Tesco uh, business in 12 countries that Tesco operate in. So it started off very much as a supermarket brand, and these are just some pictures of our uh, stores uh, in the UK, actually. Um, and we've eventually then opened up into some shopping malls. So we actually started off in Central Europe, in the Czech Republic, and opened our first standalone store uh, in Prague, uh, in the Palladium Shopping Centre, for those who know it. And this is the store. We then moved to the second city within uh, the Czech Republic uh, and opened our second store. So we went from our shopping shop concept within our own supermarket uh, footage into standalone stores. And our ambition for the brand is quite bold, but we actually intend to be the world's biggest, most clearly defined, affordable fashion brand. And the affordable is really key uh, to that statement. So franchising is one of the routes that we will grow the brand significantly over the next few years. Uh, franchising is something that's new to Tesco. We haven't franchised things, the, the business and parts of the business before. Uh, and so we started off franchising F&F &F in Saudi Arabia as our first country with Alloc Air, who you, Brendan represents here today. That first store opened last May. Um, to this day, we're now trading in 20 stores in Saudi Arabia. And we've also opened in some other countries, including Switzerland, Gibraltar, Kazakhstan, Georgia, and others. So we're now, as we stand today, trading out of 36 stores uh, in seven countries, and we'll finish the year with 60 stores. The ambition is to be in several hundred stores in a few years from now, and we reckon that that'll be in about 45 countries uh, with about 18 partners. That's where we see the brand going in the next five years. Now, clearly, when we're assessing a market to go into, we look at a load of criteria and factors, and these are just some of the, the ones that we... They're important. They're all important, but here's some that we sort of I've brought it to, to focus on today. The first thing is the size of the prize. You know, is the market big enough, or is a group of markets big enough with one partner to make it worth everybody's effort? And so we'll look at the size of the business in five years from the time we start. Look at the business plans and make a decision on whether that market's a priority for us today or not. So quite obviously, one of the key criteria. The other one is that we believe that the F&F &F clothing brand has a point of difference in that market. As you look around the world, you see a lot of the, the premium end is the premium end. You see the middle market brands quite saturated. 
and actually very little at the affordable fashion end. And very often it's run by local brands rather than brands that are, have got international heritage. And we look at whether we can fill a place there. And that obviously means that there aren't, there aren't huge barriers to entry. The import duties aren't going to kill the business before it starts. And we can actually get stock in in a reasonably good way. And the other big thing is, is there a partner there that we want to work with, that we feel we can work with, who will, who will essentially run the business for us? And that leads on to the second part then about the partner. So clearly we need somebody who's got experience and some unique uh, some USPs about the market itself. Um, they've got a track record of delivering in that market, usually, but not always in the retail area, but they've actually got some, some, uh, something we can see and share. And the third point here is a little bit of a cliche, but actually they're people we can work with. There's a chemistry, there's, there's a desire to grow the business. In most of the markets that we've got our own tr our clothing brand, in most of the markets, we're the number one fashion brand by sales. And so actually what we want is a partner that actually feels they can change the market in which we're trading in. It may not be that we'll be the number one, but actually we are going to be an important brand in that market and the partner has to share that ambition with us. So our first market, and you know, we had a list of markets and Saudi Arabia wasn't number one on that list, but the first market was an opportunity, partly by, uh, developed by the partner and partly by us, and that was in Saudi Arabia. So as I said, that was launched in May 2012, and we'll have 30 stores trading in Saudi by the end of this year. Um, the stores are trading very well, and actually, when you look at the demographics and the economy in uh, Saudi Arabia, it's easy to see why. We need a young, fairly affluent, not always affluent, but we need a young population, a young demographic to buy our products, and Saudi has that. It's got 29 million people and a young profile. It's obviously a wealthy country on the back of the oil industry and so on, and they've already got a wide acceptance of international brands in that market, which makes it easy for us to tick the box of uh, getting our brand accepted. And we also had, importantly, interest from the partner, Alloc Air. So essentially, we move forward there for the first, first time, and, and it's doing very well, I'm pleased to say. We've also, when we look at the sand and snow analogy, we've also opened in the CIS region in Georgia and Kazakhstan uh, recently. We've just got only two stores trading in Kazakhstan at the moment. It's a very small, it's just, just started and there's, there's a way to go for us. One in uh, Almaty and one in Shimkent. Um, but again, Kazakhstan, why wouldn't you be there? It's 17 million people. It's a massive country geographically and with some big, uh, some big cities. Not hugely affluent, but it's a growing economy and it's one that we're sort of in there at the beginning of the, uh, the retail evolution, and we feel it would be the right place for us to be long term. So when I look at the sand and snow analogy, as it happens, sand and snow are our first markets, Saudi Arabia, Georgia, Kazakhstan. It's been because we've firstly got a good partner that's made it easiest for, to get access to those markets, and they had something to offer for us in those markets. Um, there are two markets, two different types of markets at very different levels of maturity. Saudi Arabia is an established retail scene, Kazakhstan is not. But we see that about 20%, 22% of our stores will be in that region, those regions of the Middle East and the CIS in five years from now. So they are and they will be very important to us. Thank you very much. We're going to continue uh, with, uh, with the second presentation. Uh, Martin, can, Norman, can you uh, tell us about uh, your experience? Uh, Norman Jaskolka uh, is the president of uh, Aldo uh, Corporation, who is a successful retailer in, front, uh, in uh, quite many countries. Uh, and uh, he's going to tell us about uh, their developments in, uh, in the countries uh, uh, with their very liberal, liberal uh, name, Sand and Snow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, basically, today what I'd like to do is um, tell you a little bit about uh, the Aldo Group. Some of you may not be that aware about Aldo. 
It's not about trying to, to sell you on Aldo or so on. It's just to, to give you a bit of a context as to what, who Aldo is, what we are, and then you can use um, some of your own imagination to be able to see. So how does what we, who we are or what we have done, how can it apply to your particular company uh, or your particular product range uh, and apply it? So what I'll do is share some of the experiences uh, about us. So basically, um, I'm going to talk about the history of Aldo, its values and its vision. Our group in uh, our stores in Central Asia, the former Soviet republics and the Baltics, because I had thought that that was a focus, but I will talk very briefly about the BRIC countries, and our learnings from the region. And the learnings, I'm talking very specific to Aldo, and that's the case where I say, why don't you look at what I'm saying regarding footwear, and you can maybe apply it to whatever category of product that you have. So basically, um, the Aldo Group is a privately held company. We're headquartered in Montreal, in Canada. Uh, and uh, basically, there's one person who owns the company, and his name is Aldo Bensadun. So there is a Mr. Aldo. There's a company called the Aldo Group. And our primary brand is the Aldo brand. We have a set of brands all in footwear. And he is a very celebrated and well-known businessman in Canada and has won many awards in Canada and being inducted to the Canadian Business Hall of Fame and receiving all kinds of Order of Canada awards and so on. It's an adopted country for him. He's originally from Morocco and then he moved to Toulouse in France and his father had a footwear store in Toulouse called Au Pied Mignon and then he went to school in, uh, at Cornell in the United States and one semester he went to visit Canada and he fell in love with Montreal because it had a French aspect and that's where he ended up uh, in having his roots. So basically, our company has three strong values, which is love, integrity, and respect. And again, I'm telling you this not to sell you about Aldo, but just in terms of being a company, being able to adapt to many countries of the world, I think it's important to have many strong values. And so I know when I graduated from university, I never thought that I'd be the member of a cult and that every morning before I go to work, I'd put on my pin and each corner of the triangle represents one of our values. But if I don't put my pin on every day, it means that I'm missing something. And, and these values are very important to us. So it's love. It's about loving the things we do, loving the people we work with. It's about integrity, being honest in all of our dealings. And I, I know I have many friends in the audience today, and I hope that their image of how I've conducted myself or our company has conducted itself is one of being a company that's fair and honest uh, at all times. And that's also with our customers and making sure that the product that we're offering to our customers is fair, that we're not trying to take advantage of everyone. And it's respect. It's respect for people having different opinions and for different cultures in life. And again, as you hear about how many countries we're in and so on, unless you have that appreciation of people coming from different religions than you come, from different ethnicities, from different cultures, unless you can accept that as part of your DNA, okay, it's going to be very difficult for you to operate in different countries. So we have a vision. It's, it's about having love, integrity, and respect, having social consciousness. We give back a lot to all communities we're in, having a people-first work environment, and that then creates what I call pride, passion, and a pioneering spirit. Once you have employees with that kind of passion and that kind of attitude, and you have a world-class retail concept, and you have professional management, you put those three together, and you can have outstanding results. If you have a great people environment, but you don't have a world-class brand, it's not going to work. If you have a great brand, but you don't have professional management, it's not going to work. So it's really all three of those things together that's the basis and the foundation upon which we built ourselves. So we started in Canada in 1972. Canada is not a big country. It's got 34 million people today. It didn't have 34 million people then. Um, and then we became a North American powerhouse. And we're the first Canadian retailer to ever have succeeded in the United States. So people tend to look at North America as one. The truth is Canada has 30 million people and the United States is 300 million people. We have different values, we take different positions in the world and different uh, points of view. And from a fashion perspective, no Canadian brand was ever respected by the American consumer as being a brand they should aspire to. And from there we became an international player and that's an image of our store, it's the real image of our store in Times Square. If you just look at the size of the billboards on top of our store, that's the store we actually opened last year. So our company is called the Aldo Group. We actually have five banners in the company, okay? It's a, we're a fashion footwear and accessories company. Our main brand is called Aldo, and it's in 79 countries and has 1,200 stores. We have a brand called Aldo Accessories, which are standalone accessory stores. That's in 18 countries and has 165 stores. We have a brand which is slightly younger than Aldo. Aldo is aimed to the 18 to 35-year-old customer. 
Um, and we have another brand called Call It Spring, which is aimed to the 15 to 25 year old customer. Um, and the price point is about 30% less than Aldo. So this is in 21 countries, 340 stores. Then we have a multi-brand concept that's only in Canada. We're the leaders in Canada in the multi-brand young fashion footwear business where we have 35 stores. And then we have a big box store, a family concept out of the city called Globo, which has 29 stores. So by the end of this year, we should have 17, about 1,800 stores. In Canada, the United States, and the UK, it's our own stores. And in every other country of the world, it's with a local franchise partner who has to open all of the stores. It's, no ma it's not a master franchise where someone has the right to do what they want to do once they get the rights. We're giving the rights to an Aldo for the country who has the resources and the infrastructure and the real estate connections in, uh, in order to operate the business. So here's a little bit about Aldo for some of you who don't know it. Just again, to put you in perspective, this is a picture of an Aldo store. Um, here's the picture of the inside of an Aldo store. This is a store in Canada. Um, this is our campaign right now called Give Me Aldo, and we use that to use different derivations of Give Me, and I'll explain to you shortly how that doesn't always work in some of the countries which we're talking about today. And this is some of the product, just some examples of some of the product. Then for Call It Spring, I told you this is a concept uh, slightly younger than Aldo. So here's an image of a Call It Spring store. You'll, uh, this is the in inside of a store on Oxford Street in London. Um, if you look at the campaign images, you see it's a little bit different, a little bit younger than the Aldo campaign images. You see it's about young people having fun and so on. And that's some of the product in the Call It Spring brand. Our company sales, we're a private company, but our sales are uh, $1.8 billion, and you can see the growth that's taken place over the years. Um, we'll finish this year in 81 countries, and uh, we'll have about 1,800 stores by the end of this year. And this year, you'll see this in the dark part is the part of the world where we already have stores. The red part are parts of the world where we don't have stores right now. The discussion today is about the contrast between brick and other countries, or sand versus snow. The reality is that when I started Aldo International 12 years ago, um, we, we have, and we still do use, something called a country assessment. And we developed our own approach to assessing a country, looking at all kinds of different metrics, and then we gave a score. And if, this, and if the country met that score, it meant it was interesting to go into. The reality is I've never rejected a country. So I make my team go through the exercise. It makes us understand all of the issues relating to competition, product importation, fashionability, pricing, and so on. But I felt that one way or another, we can compete in each country. So yes, we have to adapt ourselves, but there's no country we would not go into unless for, ever, for whatever reason, the importation of product and the distribution of product was limited in those countries. Um, so in Central Asia, the former Soviet republics and, and, and the Baltics, just per se, um, here are some of the countries that we're in right now. Um, it's still kind of early stage for us. We have at this point in time 45 stores in these, in these particular countries. So in, in, uh, in Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, and Russia, and we'll be opening in Estonia next year. If I compare this to the BRIC countries, in the BRIC countries we are not in Brazil, because of import duties that limit us from going into Brazil. But in, uh, in India and China and Russia, we have uh, 65 stores. So it's still early stage for us, and we're actually developing a strategy on a macro basis to see where's the world consumption going in the future and adapting our strategies to where it's going, which means in some of these countries we'll be having some very special strategies. So what have we learned? Okay, again, I'm telling to, talking to you about shoes or boots, but you can apply this to anything. What I'm trying to say is that if you want to succeed internationally, you have to be aware of the issues you face in different countries. So the first one for us, we see that you need a lot more boots than you do in other markets of the world. You need a higher blend of boots. So the percentage of your product, which is boot versus shoe, has to be higher. You need fur-lined boots, okay? You need boots that have rubber soles because it's slippery. So if you have a boot with a leather sole, people are gonna fall all over the street. You need boots that have tractor soles, that have soles that actually can grip the ground. And that could be the case in Norway on November the 1st, when people, they like to take buses, they like to walk on the street, but they need boots that are gonna grip the ground. So this is something that, if you're going to adapt, you have to adapt to the market. So whatever category you're in, don't worry about these boots, it's more about the issue of having to kind of, let's say, go global, which is be a global brand, but localize in each market. 
The second thing is that, that's common for us in many of these markets is that the disposable income per capita is not, as, is not high across the region. So we have to be sensitive to that. So in our collection, which is a very big collection, we have to make sure we have more, a more value-priced part of the collection into the market. Okay, so again, if you're going to be an international brand and you want to be in the sand and the stone and the snow or the poor and the rich, however you want to call it, the issue has to be that you have to adapt and understand what part of the collection. I could tell you that in Latvia, the shoes, the desire of shoes is different than it is in Lith Lithuania in terms of fashionability. One of those countries is more fashionable than the other. So you have to really adapt to the needs of each market. Then celebrity endorsement is very important. Okay, so this was... Anne, Hath Anne Hathaway last year at the, at the Academy Awards wearing a Chanel dress and Aldo shoes. Okay, so this was very important. And in many of these markets, the confirmation of the brand through celebrity endorsement becomes something very important. But there's also challenges in the operations. So the first one is it's difficult to recruit sales staff and the right sales staff for the stores. Okay, you may be able to hire people, but you have to have the right people working in the stores. And staff turnover is higher than normal. People may not be happy with the job, somebody else offers them a little bit more money, or they don't like working as hard as we normally work in our stores. The second is that I've always felt that our product is 50% of our story, and our operations is the other 50% of our story. So the Aldo DNA is very important. If someone wants to associate and be the Aldo partner in a country, they have to be great operators, because that's part of the formula. But it's very hard in many of these countries to find staff that are going to be able to warm up to that DNA. And I'll give you an example. If you look at the second to last one, in many of these countries, they come from a world where there's someone who's the boss or someone who's the general who gives orders to other people. So like in our store, someone is the manager, gives orders to the staff. But that's not the Aldo approach. The Aldo approach is a team approach in the store. So we come in with our manuals, our way of doing customer service, and all of a sudden we come into markets where we can't do it. The staff are not allowed to express themselves the way, the way they are in our kind of environment. So it becomes a challenge for us on how we can incorporate our standards into the country. Another th thing is that the staff don't always come from the same financial background as the customers, or they may not have fashion experience. So in many of these countries, the people working in the stores are not at the same level as the customer. That becomes very difficult for us, because our staff are supposed to be advisors to our customers, and they don't have credibility in many of these markets. It becomes a customer comes in and just tells the staff, go get me those shoes, as opposed to an interaction with the staff. Looks good on you. But if someone who the, who the customer doesn't respect is saying, hey, it looks good on you, it doesn't mean anything, right? So it's important that we deal with that. Many of the staff don't have a lot of money. And so, yes, our partners will insist that the staff wear a pair of Aldo shoes when they're serving the customer, right? But it's a challenge. The company has to give the shoes to the staff in order to be able to make it happen. Also, language barriers. In many of these countries, you know, we come from a background, yes, you know, we're, we speak English, we speak sp French, we speak Spanish, our manuals are in all kind of languages if necessary, but in many of these countries, they don't speak those languages. So then how can we incorporate our manuals and our sales and operations approaches uh, into these stores? The other thing is the marketing content might have to be ad adapted. So I told you before, our campaign is Give Me Aldo. So we use those words, give me, that's this season, to play with different things. So it might be, give me, uh, give me, give me uh, motorcycles. And so we'll have a range of product that's good for motorcycle, like motorcycle boots and stuff like that. So in one country, we had a thing that, said that was, um, give me comfort. We were trying to get people to appreciate that we had fur-lined boots in the region. And the partner said, no, no, it's no good. No one's going to understand that give me comfort means fur-lined boots. So we have to readapt the wording and watch the languages. It's just an example of adapting to the markets that if you're a global brand, you may have to be ready, and you will have to be ready, not you may have to be ready, to adapt yourselves to the needs of every market. So these are examples simply of our case in footwear for these markets we're talking about. But please use your imagination to see how can it apply to your situation based on economy, culture, climate, and so on. But basically, um, you know, our approach is we believe in the region. Uh, we, we believe the, the region is going to continue to mature. And we feel that participating in its growth at this point in time is very important. Okay? Our partner also is the Alvacare Group in, the, in many of the CIS regions. And they have been our mode of entry into the market. Um, and we are working with them so that 
as they face the challenges of getting the standards of the stores up to, up to the, what we're looking for, that we work together and build towards the ultimate, ultimate goal. But by planting the seeds today, we will have the brand in place and the stores in place for that day, we hope very soon, where these, the standards across this region will be the same as every, everywhere else. Okay, thank you very much. continue with Brenton and uh, I hope we will uh, have some time for uh, questions uh, so Brenton please uh, hurry, hurry up uh, Brenton uh, is uh, the uh, person envoy to the uh, president and uh, the uh, responsible for business development at the uh, Havas uh, Alcoir group uh, who is uh, a partner to Aldo and Tesco as uh, you have heard uh, they are present in uh, many countries uh, of the sand and snow, and uh, they are only country in, uh, in their region that is uh, actually traded on the uh, stock exchange uh, of, of their kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brendan Dorian. As uh, you've just heard, I'm personal envoy to the chairman and head of business development for Fawaz al Hakir and Company. Uh, Norman and Marcus are two of the best retailers that you will meet in the world, not just at MAPIC. Uh, Marcus sits atop the third largest retailer in the world and is responsible for the global expansion of his brand, FNF. And he's a terrific guy, he's a quick study, and I urge you to go and speak to him today after the session. Norman has done something that few other retailers have done before. He's taken his brand to 79 countries, He's been in more countries in the world than Kofi Annan, and he is a genius, a real genius when it comes to international franchising. And actually, he commented before we came up on stage that this session, among the presenters, we probably have more hair than any other session here at MAPIC today. <laughs> he said, we're going to give them good hair, so let's try and give you good information too. Um, this is a representation of our countries of operation. Now, the figures are actually out of date. This, uh, this was done uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this year, we will open somewhere in the world a new store every 18 hours. Remember that number. Every 18 hours, somewhere in the world, we will open our doors and cross our fingers that customers come across the threshold and buy from us. This represents our brand portfolio. This represents the life work of our three principals, uh, Sheikh Fawaz Abdulaziz al Hakir, his brother, Dr. Abdul Majid, and his other brother, Engineer Salman. All of them in their 40s, all of them extremely entrepreneurial, and all of them, for the past 23 years, have put their capital and their personal wealth on the line to grow a franchise business, working with partners such as Tesco, such as Aldo. So this represents their life work, not mine. And it's important that you understand that also. This is our countries of expansion. This is where we are going to go. We have unabated ambition to grow around the world. And consistent with the theme of the session, sand and snow, we're focusing on those markets which are not brick markets, but offer, in our opinion, more lucrative growth opportunities and more return on our investment. This is a focus on the Caucasus region uh, across Central Asia, and uh, we will shortly be announcing more acquisitions in this region so that we can grow exponentially rather than organically. Now, when we come to enter a market, how do we decide to enter a market? There's always the imperial measurements that everyone uses. Uh, Norman, Marcus, we all use them. But we use these measurements as a way of understanding a market from a subjective point of view. And these are, these are emotive issues, but retailing is an emotional thing, and long-term investment is an emotional thing. So if you start with the first one, a paucity of retail space. Why would a retailer go where there's no retail space? Well, we go there because we build, we create, and we bring with us brands that don't currently exist. And then we take the aspiration of the consumers in that market, and we turn it into sales. The most important thing that we look for is a future. Do we feel when we go to the market that there is a future in that market for our brand, for the country? Beyond that, 
for all of you who are interested in international growth, there's a metric that we use, which we don't know that anyone else uses, and that is mobile phone penetration in a country. If you want to measure wealth, don't just look at the GDP that you'll find in the World Factbook, because it doesn't actually resonate or correlate with our experience, because in Central Asia, if we went by GDP, we wouldn't go. But we've gone to Central Asia, we've opened over 150 stores, and this is a, a, a region of the world where GDP is very low, but all of our brands are mid-market brands. Excuse me, and they're all doing very well. On to our method of entry. We use a program called Instant Critical Mass. It's how we sell ourselves to a prospective brand partner. And what we offer them is not the chance to open one store, cross their fingers and hope that they'll be successful, but the opportunity to study a market properly, to partner with us, and then to grow very quickly. Now this means that instead of opening one store, such as Tesco, we'll be at uh, 30 stores by the end of this year, who would think that? that a franchise partner would open that number of stores in less than a year. It's a huge investment, it's a huge commitment on the part of Tesco to trust us, and it's also an awful lot of work. So instant critical mass brings us economies of scale, operational velocity and tempo. This is really important to us. Our business is like a metronome, constantly ticking out a beat, because we have to make that 18 hour target. We have to open a store every 18 hours to make our sales number, to make our profit number. And the collective brand equity is also important. We have a portfolio of brands. So when we approach a landlord, to be able to say that we want, instead of 200 square meters, as one brand might, we say we want 40,000 square meters, or we want 80% of your mall. And that gives us a dominance, a negotiating position, which others don't enjoy. Now, this gives you some representation of the achievement that we've had in Central Asia and Morocco over the past 18 months. So this is a timeline that these statistics refer to. And any one of these statistics is quite phenomenal. The one that's most important for me would resonate with both Norman and Marcus is 1,630 jobs created. That's direct employment that we've created in a market which not only supports the country, but obviously supports all of the brands that we are bringing in. We are creating wealth in the market in which we operate. And here is an example of how we've done it in each country. Now, these statistics represent what we did in each country. They didn't all start at the same time, but this is the time that we took to do certain things. And if you look at Morocco, 18 stores opened in one day. That's not actually our best. Our best was in, uh, in Jeddah when we opened 68 brands in one day. Uh, these are now just photographs of the, the brands that we have. Terrific Aldo store, Gap. You can see them all. And in these photographs, what you should see is, is trust. These brands trust us because when you come to represent a brand, you have to be good at doing the boringly repetitive. You have to be world class. You have to master the mundane. We are like a retail Xerox machine. All we do is copy, copy, copy. If Norman sends it in blue, we don't ask for it in red. If Marcus sends it in black, we don't ask for it in white. We take what we're given and we replicate the brand. And the result of all of this hard work, this slide, which I produced this morning actually, shows our share price. We are listed on this Audi Stock Exchange because we want to be transparent and let partners see everything that we do. Let them interrogate our background and our performance without having to ask us. Thank you very much indeed. job that uh, those companies are doing is uh, exceptional and uh, inspiring. Uh, I was wondering, uh, perhaps uh, Brandon, and uh, uh, does it get any easier? I mean, uh, normally you say that uh, it takes uh, something around 10,000 hours uh, to uh, become a master in something. Uh, when you open so many shops in, in such a quick time, does it get uh, quicker? 
Does it get easier? Well, I, I mentioned earlier that we have an operational velocity, a tempo. I, I use the word metronome. We have a machine, our business is a machine that is built and designed to open stores effectively in, uh, to a good standard and in the way that the brand partner would expect. So it doesn't get any easier. It's always hard. But if it was easy, everybody would do it. Thank you. Uh, we were talking about uh, sand and snow countries uh, as uh, in comparison with the brie countries. Uh, um, quite uh, often, uh, even economists uh, nowadays say that uh, it shouldn't really be uh, brie countries, but uh, uh, only C should be uh, left in this uh, uh, acronym. Uh, because uh, all of uh, those countries are not performing uh, well, apart from uh, China, maybe. Uh, is it a choice uh, uh, that you have made uh, from the very beginning, when the brick was uh, uh, actually uh, uh, sort of a miracle, that you are not going to the brick countries, but uh, concentrating on a lucrative uh, new markets that perhaps uh, some sometimes are overlooked, or it was just a chance and uh, luck? No, I, in our case, we, we are in the BRIC countries. The only BRIC country we're not in is, uh, is Brazil because they have very high uh, import restrictions to protect their industry. So that's the only reason. And I think that, um, I think it's a, a, an issue of going to places where there's opportunity. And when you reach the size we're at, or they were Alphacare or, or Tesco, I don't think it's about, uh, and, and if you use a franchise model which allows you to have different partners opening at the same time, um, I don't think one affects the other. So I think that today, if you look at the demographics of the world, to ignore China or ignore India, when two thirds of the world's middle class is gonna be in those countries by 2025, if you're gonna ignore those countries, you're gonna be missing out on a massive opportunity. But at the same time, you have emerging markets, you know, virgin type territories where, like the markets we discussed today, where we're coming in at this point in time, competition is at a different level. The retail landscape is being formed. There's an opportunity to be a brand leader. Um, and, and when you have this, you have great opportunity for your company as well. So to, we don't see it as one versus the other. And I certainly wouldn't tell anyone to ignore the BRIC countries. I think that there are very few stories up to this point in time of people making a lot of money uh, in the BRIC countries. And, and if you're gonna go in there, you better have factored in the cumulative investment you're gonna have, which is the sum of all the losses over the years until hopefully there'll be an inflection point and profits are going to come. But you have to be patient and you have to understand what those markets are looking for. Do you have something to add? Um, I was just add a, from Tesco's perspective, uh, we, we have a business in India and China. Um, Russia, from, from the clothing side, we're obviously very seriously looking at and I hope that we'll open something there late spring, so Russia should also be there. Uh, Brazil, for the reasons that Norma mentioned, is a little bit more complex with the import duty side of things, but at the end of the day, everybody's on a level playing field if you're an international brand going into the market. So. If you can still compete well as an international brand, there still is a good potential there. So Brazil, it's, it for us, is just a question of time as well. So um, if, if you're looking at going to 45-odd countries on top of the 12 you operate on anyway, the, the, there's very few restrictions that will stop you going somewhere, actually. Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, questions from the audience? Yes, please. Brandon, I have this question for you. We very clearly see that you are creating a strategic partnership with your brands. And this partnership is not just margins, where the, in the rest of the world you talk about margins mostly. Uh, we see that very clearly that you are, this partnership is involving values as well, very clearly uh, from the presentations. What are the main values that you share with your partners, brand partners? Uh, this is not plural. The answer is not plural. It's uh, single, and that's trust. They trust us. It doesn't go beyond that. And the relationship starts across the table with people like Norman and Marcus, and it continues through the hierarchy, through the brand directors, through the store managers, through the four other part-timers who we are trusted to hire to represent the brand. So it's all about trust. 
If I can just add a, a, a story that Brendan doesn't know about. But in, uh, we started with Alpha Care in, the, uh, in late 2001. And in March 2002, we had an international sales training um, uh, weekend where we were training our own people plus our franchise partners. And it was an early stage. And I remember the, uh, the Alpha Care British sales and operations person, someone who had moved to Saudi Arabia to support the business, finishes the two-day session. I was with the group in the, in the countryside. Um, it was snow. And, uh, and says, none of this can apply to Saudi Arabia. Only men work in stores. You can't talk to people and so on. So um, I immediately called Al Hakir and I said, I'd like that person to be removed from the company right now. Because if they didn't learn from this to say, okay, so now I get it. Now how can I apply it to my environment? Okay, what do I, of course it's not gonna be the same because it's a different, there's different laws and so on, but what did I learn from this that I then can adapt to my environment? And that's how we look at a Saudi Arabia. We might say the, you know, Whatever it is, human rights might not be the same as in the countries we live in and so on. It might be different rules, but it's about working with a partner, teaching, hopefully extending our values to that environment, and hopefully being able to make a difference that'll even show up in our stores in terms of performance by virtue of that attitude change. That's how we deal with it. Do you have uh, some other questions? Uh, Brendan, I was wondering how difficult it is uh, to actually uh, get this DNA that uh, a brand has, and each brand uh, obviously has uh, different uh, values and uh, different uh, uh, DNA, uh, how difficult it is uh, as a franchiser to uh, uh, get it uh, further and uh, uh, do the same thing that a brand would actually do. I'm tempted to avoid the answer because in giving an answer, I give up some of our competitive advantage and uh, some of our That's why people are here. Competitors are here. Um, really, you, 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 it, it comes back to understanding the brand and being able to replicate the brand and to replicate the sense and the sincerity and the sentiment that you find when you engage with brand partners. And that starts at the very first meeting. You know, I, I'm negotiating transactions at the moment, which I started to negotiate one and a half years ago. And over the course of time, we get to know the brand partner. And similarly, by the time they get to opening in our business, we've recruited a brand director who we think best represents us and can best represent that new brand. And that brand director then distills this DNA across their vertical business within our Thank you. I think we can uh, finish here and uh, I would like to thank uh, our speakers, not only for the uh, wonderful presentations that uh, they have uh, made, but uh, also for uh, an excellent uh, job that uh, they are doing uh, on a daily basis. Uh, I don't know how about you, but uh, they are really an inspiration uh, for me. And uh, I hope that uh, they continue a great job. Uh, I was happy to know that Aldo is coming to Estonia next year. Um, thank you and uh, goodbye.